Hello and welcome to the What Culture Wrestling Roundtable podcast. I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, joined by the Dadly Boys of What Culture, Michael Hamflet and Michael Sidgwick, to discuss all the big wrestling talking points this week. But before we begin, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, all one word, on iTunes or Spotify for daily podcasts where we review pay per views. Raw, SmackDown, we have roundtable discussions like this. We have interviews, there's a great interview on there right now with Taz, and a round of the week complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. But gents, uh, let's get into it. Lots to discuss this week. The most obvious place to start is, of course, WWE Crown Jewel. Um, and I don't really know whether to say will they or won't they, so I'm just going to ask, should WWE not do Crown Jewel in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There's two ways of looking at this from a moral and financial standpoint. And I'm going to take the moral. I'll let you do the financial. All right. Now, I can see you comment section already. I'm wearing a cardigan. I am bespectacled. You're going to call me a cook for this. But Donald Trump is willingly letting the United States of America get doubly penetrated by Russia and Saudi Arabia. So who's the real cook here? But furthermore... It started. <laughs> but like... You can call me a cook, an SJW, all you want. Like, I really don't think WWE should go through with this at all. But what is happening is reprehensible. And, I mean, just the locker room don't want to go. The production staff do not want to go. And even by their own rationale for going, it's completely wrong. JBL said it. Randy Orton said it on TMZ. They have to go, apparently, in order to make things better in Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was three years old and I was being naughty, I was punished. I wasn't rewarded with bad behavior. And because I wasn't rewarded, I realized, oh, hang on, I can't do that anymore. Otherwise, I won't get nice things. And the idea that Team America, WWE, is going <laughs> to go into Saudi Arabia and make things better, it's just absolutely stupid. And I think if they wanted... They don't want change, obviously. <laughs> they just want money. But if they want to change, then don't go. Make, like, whatever WWE is going to do or not is going to have absolutely no impact on the geopolitical landscape across the world at all. I mean, consider the voices that are the ones actually saying you have to go. We're dealing with Randy Orton and JBL, yeah. like two voices that are constantly derided for the, the type of people that they've often just admitted to being. And they're the two that have been confident enough to speak out and put their heads above because a lot of the wrestlers probably desperately don't want they to. They don't want to buy and, uh, all and, uh, To be fair, uh, like, you know, job scared and don't want to say anything. And I think that's understandable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, WWE, like... This is the second show of a 10-year deal. This is incredible. If they turn back this show, they've still got to continue to turn back the one after that and the one after that. Because this kind of story doesn't go away. That's assuming that nothing else happens again. In a 10-year deal, we have to assume that Saudi Arabia continues well, on this. happening. Qatar's happening. Like, yeah. Horrible things are happening. This laughable road to recovery that they basically try to couch in the form of video packages of the place looking pretty at Greatest Royal Rumble is basically all they've got in their chamber against countless hard evidence that this country's really not fit for this kind of promotion from an organisation that, as we've said countless times, should know better, but, you know, has never been in such a position and not really care. I would just wish they'd do right by the roster who simply, by all accounts, do not want to go. Yeah, Look after your own. Sports mm. Illustrated reported uh, earlier this week, I think it was, yeah, that there was uh, sources saying that the majority of the, the, the roster do not want to go, but the general response has been, as far as I can tell, that unless the US State Department or President Donald Trump says, don't go, it's happening. Which is basically, do we do we like getting rid of the kind of uh, like taking away their own autonomy in a situation like this. They could actually be the ones to say, we're not going to do this. But instead, they're basically using higher, high, higher powers, higher authorities to make the decision for them. It's a tough choice that they particularly don't want to make. Now, uh, there's, oh, there was already issues around this prior to all these, these, these uh, uh, reporters and all the stories that have been coming out since then about evolution being followed within, within a week by Crown Jewel. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is there an element to think that maybe WWE are hoping that not necessarily this blows over, but all the attention gets drawn to evolution over the next week? They should have done uh, it afterwards. And then, mm -hmm. but maybe they're thinking that if they do that, by the time, you know, evolution happens, and then in, in theory, in five days, follow, the five days following that, you then have Crown Jewel. So maybe you're distracting. Look over here. It's the classic WWE like thing. the Roman Reigns <laughs> tactic for getting over. <laughs> Look over here, and then by the time, oh, it's already happened. But... 
one senses this is getting bigger and bigger. You know, we saw it was uh, last week tonight. John Oliver reported on it uh, and mentioned WWE, of yeah. course. Mm. Uh, I know Adam Cleary's been doing a, a lot of reporting on this recently and talked about UFC pulling out of those sort of you know those the areas. parent company. Yeah, the parent um, company. Endeavor was going to due to receive a. Four hundred million dollar investment, and they've just said no, don't want that anymore. It's the dirtiest of money, but it's if WWE still go ahead and take the show, I don't think there is a low bar for what cash they'll take for sort of similar deals like this. Now, what do you make of what we saw earlier this week, where on they they on Raw they did not mention where it would be taking place on WWE's.com's website. There was no listing. There's just the date and time yeah. uh, for the pay per view. Does that lend any credence to the fact that maybe it won't be going ahead in Saudi Arabia? Or is that sort of them trying to put out some fires and hopefully people no, don't notice? I think they're just literally trying to not draw attention to it. Oh, which geez. is like, which again, they're trying to promote a show. So just real, like, just puts into perspective how they can't really proceed with this, in my opinion. The saddest thing to me is that I think that a lot of people immediately rush to the conclusion that, oh, that this must mean that they're going to like look at changing the venue or they just want to keep the show alive and they're not too bothered about the location. I actually think the company want it to happen in Saudi Arabia. They want this to blow over because if this blows over and they get to run there, there's nothing really. Everything else will be small fry. Like, if you think back to the scandal about women not being able to travel for the show last time, that feels small change compared to, like, you know, a disappeared journalist. You know, we're, we're learning more and more about the, the horrors of this story. Mm -hmm. But this has got to be a low bar. There's nothing more in this 10-year deal that can be as horrific as this. Like, and if they get through this and they get that show done, then nothing's going to get in the way of two a year for the next nine years, which is incredible, but that'll probably be what WWE want to go ahead. Everything gets easier from here on out if the show goes ahead. We can infer from the fact that they want it to happen that financially there's more of a risk of them not taking this money than there is from irritating sponsors who yep. seem not to care. Mm -hmm. If there was more money getting lost from like sponsors pulling out of various things, then they're going to lose from Saudi Arabia. Then I... So I think from a financial impact, that's the only reason why they're proceeding. I mean, it expresses a remarkable confidence in brand as well. Like that organization, either through naivety or negligence or whatever, must feel so assured in like the, the future of WWE, whether it be through the television rights or whatever, that they can like potentially have this scandal come and then go and the brand not be too damaged. There's been things before where they would have reacted a lot quicker. You know, if you if you think back to the Benoit case, like the, the brand was in the bin for about a year and like a, a PG sort of rating change, a resurgence, a complete reinvention of how they sort of like manage their, their wellness policy mm -hmm. and things like that. This is on another level. And yet there's so much money, more money than we've ever experienced, like as the, the company earning, that they're able to just like brush it to one side. That's it's, what I, it's that, quite remarkable. That's right. what I find really repugnant about it is the Fox money that they're due to receive. And this is just more money on top of it. Yeah, so reported how, 40, uh, uh, something around $45 million for this show. Yeah, per mm -hmm. show. Um, I mean, it's outrageous. So yeah, do you think they do you think that it will still go ahead? Yeah. yeah I don't I don't want it to. I really don't. I felt Cuz there's been there's been discussion about potentially moving it to Manchester. <sighs> uh, the, the 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 rumor is that if it doesn't go ahead in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it will go ahead in the kingdom of Manchester. <laughs> um <laughs> On the Sunday, I think, because they're scheduled to do tapings on the Monday and the Tuesday anyway, so the talent would be over in the UK. But yeah, you two think it's still gonna just still gonna go ahead. Can you, yeah. can you visualize them walking backwards from this? Can you, I, can I you actually see it happening? No. I think if it was, uh, uh, they'll do propaganda videos still. Yeah, yeah. I think if it would would have been further away, perhaps you know, if it was maybe in December time, you think, well, this story's just gonna run and run and run. But I think, yeah, they're hoping. They can go, well, we're not talking about Crown Jewel right now because we're talking about WWE Evolution and isn't this great and really progressive of us. And then that happens. And like I said, it's not even a week. So you'll have a Raw or SmackDown and then it's on the Friday it'll be Crown Jewel. It's certainly an unexpected benefit of the disposable product, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's like if they, if they ever they needed not to want to react to a show on a Friday or on a Monday, this is the one to do it on. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't even, happen. didn't even happen. Well, I'm sure you will, but make sure you let us know your comments uh, in the comment section or you can tweet at us at WhatCultureWWE. Let's try and lighten the mood a yeah, little bit yeah, here, yeah. eh? Yeah. Uh, we had SmackDown... <laughs> let's, let's cook stuff, yeah. We had SmackDown 1000 uh, earlier this week. And as a part of that, my best friend Rey Mysterio came back and Evolution uh, reunited. It was, uh, you mentioned this earlier on this week on our SmackDown Review yeah. podcast, that it was kind of l l quite a low key thing that they promoted. They said it was going to happen, but it was, it was, there was no bells and whistles really about it. It was just, oh, this is going to happen. In the end, it was probably one of the highlights yeah. of the show, certainly for me. And we got Dave Batista cutting a promo, which obviously he says he doesn't enjoy doing. But it was 
pitched perfectly. Randy Orton was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who may have seen, he sort of teased a potential RKO at the end of the whole segment. But yeah, to get back to this Batista promo, uh, he talks uh, about evolution and how it's you know elevated him to what he is today. He runs through how great everyone is, Ric Flair is, Randy Orton is, gets to Triple H, sort of says, you know, you are the business. You have done everything in the industry except beat me. Are we getting Batista versus Triple H at WrestleMania 35? And am I suddenly really into this? Yeah, uh, but we're getting it somewhere. Yeah. Like, they don't dangle these carrots anymore without, like, delivering on that promise. Like, I've learned my lesson from the Shawn Ma- <laughs> the, the original uh, Shawn Michaels tease about The Undertaker. I thought, oh, they're not going to do this. He's not going to come out of retirement. Yes, he is. And I think we are, on that basis, getting this match. And, yeah, I think it's really good. And as I said on the SmackDown podcast, I wish WWE would learn a lesson from this. They sacrificed a rating, I expect. I mean, they beat Raw, I think. But Every, didn't do everybody great, beats Raw. <laughs> didn't do great numbers. I think they sacrificed a rating by a subdued sort of, oh, evolution, I'm going to reform approach and then drop this bombshell of a match that we didn't know we want, but we definitely do. And by sacrificing the short-term rating with restrained promotion, we're going to get a really hyped WrestleMania 35 match out of this. Please learn a lesson from it because it was dynamite stuff. This is going to sound cynical. I'm, by the way, I'm in full agreement. Big fan of the match. Big fan of like. I really hope it goes ahead. I genuinely felt like the reason they underplayed the Revolution hand was because like it was a bit of a way to undermine Batista's like star power. Like he's the biggest star in that ring. He's the biggest star in any WWE show he turns up on, other than The Rock right now. I think we can all agree on that. You know, he's done absolutely fine without WWE. <laughs> and I just thought like putting him in Evolution just still make reduces him to being one of Triple H's boys. As it turns out, Triple H just fancies the match. Yet again, there's like a big wrestling program for Triple H so he's more than happy to go ahead with it being a bit of a low key thing um, I will say that the, um, the the quality of Batista's work for all the guy that says he has nerves I think it was one of his one of his better efforts in the ring you can see that his, like, his acting's improved and his confidence in front of an audience has, has come on leaps and bounds um, and he just looked he looked so much happier than he was in his 2014 run. And he's been pretty open about how he was kind of like uncomfortable with the scripting and he didn't feel like they were doing enough to like turn I mean, he's a... been doing that since 2005, to be but fair. But like, he was he was quite sort of vocal about saying how they weren't turn they weren't helping turn around the, the sort of the Daniel Bryan related disdain at the time. And he felt like he had better ways of getting around it than they were giving him. But this seemed like a guy that was, wasn't was just like sort of in it for the night. He was already signed up for WrestleMania, you know? He seemed like he was immediately invested in it all over again. And I kind of think that that wouldn't be the case if this hadn't been maybe like maybe penciled in, maybe we're at that stage already. Yeah. I mean, credit where it's due. I think if you'd have told me on Monday, we might get Batista versus Triple H WrestleMania. Yes, I'd obviously be excited to see yeah. Batista mm-hmm. back in a WWE ring, but I don't think I'd have been that bothered. It was just the 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 this quality, like you say, the nuance of this promo. He does that. Uh, they obviously square up. Ric Flair separates them. They hug and what have you. And then there was just a little glance in there from, yeah. from Triple H and. We don't we don't credit WWE with a great deal of subtlety in uh, in 2018 or at any time really. <laughs> but this was was engaging. It was thrilling, and yeah, the poss- I think it got a lot of people very excited we about this. This the other day, it's a wonderful callback to the original storyline. Like back when Triple H and Batista first feuded, Randy Orton was the guy that was getting the push, but that was failing. So they threw in these little looks that Batista would like glare at Triple H or glare at the belt. And the idea was the fans all along were supposed to be like. Oh, there was the guy. He was, there's our hero stood yeah. in the background all along. And this was like a lovely callback to that. They were hugging, everything was fine, but you were allowed to see the stare. You were allowed to see that there's, there's still a similar intention that you invested in once before. That that WrestleMania 21 match was one of the highest drawing WrestleMania main events of all time. Uh, like, at the time, it was the highest was drawing. It, was yeah. it the highest? There's equity in, in this yeah. feud and those characters, you know? So like, and what Batista was, he's got to be one of the only people to get three pay-per-view wins over Triple H. There's few people that like Triple H could arguably want his win back over more. So that creates this like this meta tension almost for for one more match. Mm-hmm. And it's good for Triple H to keep him busy, I suppose. Not a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let's move on to another major event that happened on SmackDown 1000, which was Ugh. a big show heel turn. Um, we've done a list about this. Uh, Michael Hamflet wrote a gal- has done a gallery, which is up at WhatCulture.com right now. Uh, I've just converted that into a list. <laughs> which is every single face and heel turn from the big show since his WWE debut in 1999. I hope you like clicking. There <laughs> are <pleased> 31 
And that's not even including WCW. Like I said, that's just his WWE tenure. Incredible to think that he's done that many. It's an obvious joke. It's a joke that's made all the time. But when the bare evidence is laid out in front of you, 31 turns, it's insane. But anyway, uh, with that in mind... I want to know from you two and from you in the comments or on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE, what are the best and worst big show turns? You feel fired up for the worst. Uh, don't you? <laughs> you, you, have at it. Have at it. I'll do the worst. One of my least favourites out of all the ones that I didn't really like very much, I'm just not a fan of the big show, um, is You're one not allowed of, to be. He turns every five minutes. It's one, <laughs> one of the later ones, and I say this because, like, Throughout wrestling history, the monster of the life inherently has a short shelf life. So you put that kind of gimmick on the longest running episodic television program of all time. You're obviously just going to have to rinse, repeat, turn, turn, turn. And the fact that it happened so often just meant it was a total plot device that you couldn't believe in. The absolute worst of all time for me was Survivor Series 2015 Mm -hmm. when he joined the authority, the faction that made his life live in hell two years previously. He turned at the expense of John Cena for like at least the fourth time. You've actually got the cold hard data. Yeah. How many times? It was. It was actually only three. John Cena, believe it or not. Only the third time. Only the third. <laughs> only the third time. Fool me once. Fool me twice. What's the fool me three times? Oh, John I'll, Cena, you're an idiot. That's I will, say, I will say it was the third time in three years. So you know, the like Cena but was I mean, Cena was thick enough to have it happen at least once a year. <laughs> well, you're an idiot, Cena. You always have been. Um, just the SDF just put a bit more pressure on there. And, you know, you might hurt someone. Um, yeah, the fact that it was just so contrived, like such a diminished return of something that was terrible in the first place, and it was just an excuse to get John Cena out of the match. Rubbish stuff. Be more positive, please. So I was a big fan of his second baby face turn in 1999 <laughs> because it gave us the sight of him surfing on a coffin of his dead dad. Um, you know, some you know we'd all like to pay tribute to our loved ones that way. Um, and because it got shot of that dreadful tag team with The Undertaker where they talked about riding the bikes to the desert and eating lizards. Um, but, <laughs> but weirdly, I've got a bit of affection for a Royal Rumble 2001 return where he came back from OVW where he'd been sent by Jim Ross because he was hammering the hamburgers a bit too much. And because he couldn't work. He came back looking no different, got a huge pop, got this great response, was throwing guys all around, outsmarted by The Rock, turn there and there, like turn there, <laughs> threw him through a table, like screaming at the fans, screaming at The Rock, angry all over again. I love it. That's the, that's the big show's entire career, bottled, if you ask me, bullied by the company, bullied for not being a great worker, turns on The Rock, still doesn't get him anywhere. He was in the hardcore division at the next pay-per-view, having put The Rock through a table. That guy, like, Vince McMahon, I love the story that I think Bruce Pritchard told in a podcast, that Vince McMahon saw an episode of Nitro, saw the giant, and understandably being Vince McMahon said, God, the money I could make with that guy. The man believed that he gets that guy, like a giant in Vince McMahon's hands should be the safest bet. We're 31 turns in after less than 20 years. He's got to be Vince McMahon's favourite mistake. I'll like give Big Show this. His work between 2011 and 2012 with Daniel Bryan mm. and Sheamus and Mark Henry. Mark Henry, yeah. All of that stuff I thought was really, really good. Yeah. Really, really good. Um, and it almost atoned for the fact that he's been on my telly far too much. <laughs> but the years after that, 2012, uh, rubbish. Just a personal Big Show anecdote. I'm, I know you're busting to get to your favourite Big Show moment. A personal Big Show anecdote is that I went to a house show once in which Daniel Bryan was supposed to be headlining during the heated authority Daniel Bryan programme. He'd been lifted to another house show. Um, so as a result, the Big Show, as he often did, took his place against Randy Orton. <laughs> uh, the crowd, it was in Birmingham, and um, the crowd booed the match incessantly. So the Big Show took to the floor uh, to say, I've spoke to Daniel Bryan today, and he told me he wants me to kick Randy Orton's ass for all you fans in Birmingham. They booed him more. He managed <laughs> to come out of Babyface, turn heel, and then turn heel while trying to turn Babyface. <laughs> it was peak Big Show stuff. Uh, the fans were in the main event, and uh, Kane ran in for the finish. <laughs> <laughs> now, my uh, worst turn is kind of related to that. It, it's not really a specific moment. It's just when WWE decided, in the midst of this amazing Daniel Bryan-Randy Orton feud and the back and forth of the belt and SummerSlam and we all know what happened there, is, well, I'll take Daniel, Daniel Bryan out of this, put him with CM Punk and have him fight, face the White Family, put Big Show in instead. <laughs> um, let's just do the yes, just do the yes chant, because that's, that's obviously all that matters. It doesn't matter which restaurant it is, just do the yes chant. Uh, I really enjoy, I really, really enjoy doing this list. I cannot tell you how much I enjoy doing it. And my, my favourite Big Show, I think there's two, because I genuinely think I've never been as happy to see a Big Show turn as I was on Tuesday night. Because... It felt so 
what, nostalgic, I think is the word it you was, used in the article. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> SmackDown 1000, you know, we got Taker coming out, we got Rey Mysterio returning, we got Evolution, that notorious SmackDown stable, <laughs> uh, coming out. And then we have Big Show just. Right, here we are, SmackDown 1000, time to turn, you know, whatever it would have been. If he was face, he's turning heel, he's, if he was heel, he's turning face. I loved, I really enjoyed that. And the imi- I thought the image of him almost great carlying the tag team titles with the, with the bar, belts, yeah. doing that, I really enjoyed. But the other turn that I like, or should I say turns, has to be No Way Out 2008. He returns... Credit where it's due, we talked about his size. He lost a bit of weight. He looked really good, looked looked a slimmer frame than when we saw him last. Big pop. He comes out uh, post, I think it was Edge versus Rey Mysterio for the yeah. World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah. Uh, Rey Mysterio has just lost to Edge. Uh, he comes out, R- Rey's getting treated. He gets in the ring, huge, you know, huge reaction. He's basically turned babyface mm. by just returning. Uh Gets in the ring, is cutting a promo, glances to the outside where Ray's just being helped to the back, basically. This little look crosses his face, he just snarls a little bit, get out, gets out of the ring, grabs him, goes, yeah, your arm, have you? Your, your arm, like that. Turns heel, grabs him. Right, he tech, drags him round ringside, just manhandling him all over the place because poor little Ray Mysterio, you know, that sort of thing. Goes to where Floyd Mayweather and his entourage are, go, hey, here's your mate. I don't know. Was it his mate? It, they... was, it was loosely established yeah. that they had a friendship. He's moment. little and he's little. <laughs> Look at this. Best mate. <laughs> Does that. Uh, drags it, throws him into the ring. Floyd Mayweather decides, I've had enough of this. Gets in the ring. So now, that, by the way, just to those keeping school, Big Show's now heel in the matter of about five minutes after returning. With no him. motivation. No just saw yeah. a little guy. Uh, Floyd, Floyd and his entourage square up to him. He pushes him away. He kneels down and goes, it's better if I'm on your sort of level sort of thing. Uh, Floyd, where the, Floyd Mayweather swings through him, breaks his nose. Oh, that's great. Legit breaks his nose. Le- Incredible heat. Incredible. Legit breaks his nose, throws a few more punches in there for good measure. And then as Big Show is chasing him off for getting, chi- you know, for chinning him, uh, the crowd cheering him. Crowd absolutely loving Floyd it. Floyd Mayweather Not, was detestable. Because so everyone that. hates Floyd Mayweather, apparently. <laughs> so that's that's three turns on the same night. You, you, you can't beat that. The Royal Rumble, yes, you had two. Three. three. Three on the same three night. The and, and the third one wasn't even intended. It wasn't like they went, right, you'll come out a uh, baby face, you'll go heel, and then obviously no one likes Floyd Mayweather. They were thinking Floyd Mayweather, he, everyone loves yeah, him, he's a, yeah. this amazingly successful boxer. So we'll not do that. Maybe Floyd Mayweather could have the Saudi show in his house. Maybe that money could actually go to something good. I'd be nice to Big Show. When he chased after Mayweather, I looked like I was terrified of him. Was it, is there not a story that like Shane McMahon's out on screen like calming him down? He wasn't a particularly like... He wasn't a busy character at the time, and the Shane was there just thinking, like, you trust me, I'm going to have to get him to calm down, otherwise he's yeah. going to start killing fans. He, if he, yeah, can't, no, if he looked... can't reach Floyd, he's going to kill somebody. Wait, I watched it back just before we did this. Look terrifying. And yeah. he's chasing Floyd off, and obviously a lot of Floyd's entourage are wearing these white hoodies. He basically just runs over someone. <laughs> there's a, watch it back, there's some footage of it. They, they're obviously trying to hop the barricade and leg it out the back, and you know the usual thing that you'd see. One of his entourage goes down, and you'd never see him again. <laughs> just gets trampled. He was great at chinning the entourage at Mania as well. He was. He was excellent. Yeah. He did, look, the match was really good. No, this is the thing. Like, the big show has not been... It, not all of his programs have been disastrous. You know, no. the one Cedric mentioned at that kind of, like, weird late stage of his career. He got the big punch over, which I've got a lot of time for. The because, Mayweather like, match was great. The Mayweather match was really good. Uh, you know, Aki Bono, WrestleMania 21. That was probably Drew the house as well as Batista and Triple H. Yeah, bless him. Like, in a I'll, vacuum, he's done some really good stuff. I, I love the idea. But I don't need 20 years of the big show in my life. When he had came back against Randy Orton for that World Cup qualifier, I love the idea that they might have said to him, right, you're a babyface tonight, because we've got this idea about turning your heel next <laughs> week, as if that was one of the few things they planned a week in advance of SmackDown yeah. 1000, because it's so reliable. A big show turn, you can set your watch to. Ah, oh, brilliant. Well, let us know your thoughts. Let us know your favourite, uh, or, or the best and worst big show turns uh, in the comments or at... What culture WWE. In fact, watch her on Twitter. You can follow all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamflit at Michael Hamflit. You can follow Michael Sidgwick at Abuse Directed at M Sidgwick. <laughs> you can follow me at Adam Wilborn. As I said, you can follow us all at What Culture WWE. My thanks to the Dadley Boys. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week with another roundtable discussion podcast. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>